News of the Times. Murderous Mondays. Murder in Paris. Welcome to News of the Times. In today's episode, we are in Paris and the brutal slaying of a maid in what seems to be a gruesome love story. The tale sounds like one of stalking that has come to a terrible end. The recounting of the murderous tale is graphically descriptive, much more so than we would normally find in the English press. The case at the time was described as the French version of Daniel Good, a famous case in its day which we covered earlier. Interestingly as well, even with the horrific nature of the crime, a dismemberment attempt with bad tools, there seems to be a lingering sympathy with the murderer. A frightful murder in Paris in 1856 is today's episode of Murderous Mondays. We hope you enjoy the show. Generally, stories from France would receive a small paragraph. This story made all the papers in England. From the Morning Post, the 7th of August, 1856, Frightful Murder. The quarter of the Faubourg Saint-Martin had just been the scene of a frightful murder. About four o'clock in the morning before last, the attention of the porter of a house in the Rue de la Philadelphe was excited by the noise in one of the upper stories. Fearing that some of his lodgers were about to effect a clandestine removal, he got up and went out of his lodge to see what was going on. Scarcely had he ascended a few steps of the staircase when he met a man who is a clerk in a public administration and occupied a room above, bearing on his shoulders the naked body of a woman with the head cut off. On seeing the porter, and alarmed at the cry which that person raised, the man threw down the body, ascended hastily towards his room, and jumped out of the window on the second floor into the street. The upper part of a shop window on the ground floor broke his fall, and he came onto the foot pavement without having received any injury, and he ran off as fast as he could towards the Faubourg Saint-Denis. Few persons were in the street at this hour, and no one consequently stopped him. Information having been sent to the commissionary of police, that functionary was soon on the spot, accompanied by a medical man. It appears from the preliminary investigations that the now missing man, about two years ago, fell violently in love with a young girl with whom he had resided in the house for more than a year, but she one day disappeared. After searching for her for several months, he at length discovered the fugitive, but notwithstanding his earnest entreaties, she refused to renew her acquaintance with him. It is thought, however, that on Saturday she had come to his room, and that during the night the horrible crime was perpetrated, of which the circumstances are as yet but very imperfectly known. The room on its being entered was found in the greatest disorder, and everything covered with blood. The head was found in a pail. It is supposed that the missing man must have accomplished the decapitation with a razor while his victim was asleep. The age of the girl is considered by the medical men to be about from 23 to 25, but nothing has yet been found to prove her identity. The body was consequently removed to the morgue. It is supposed that the now missing man, believing that everyone was asleep in the house, would have carried the body into the street and there left it thus giving an idea that the murder had been effected in the public road, but the waking of the porter disconcerted his plans. 
How he intended to manage with the head is by no means clear. The police are making a strict search for him, but no clue to him has been had. The following are additional details. The murderer's name is Poirier. His age is 35, and he was employed as office porter by the Société Immigration Franco-Americaine, whose offices are at that address. On Saturday, the chief employees of the company, on the termination of the business of the day, said that they would go into the country in the evening and stop till Monday, and they left him in charge of the offices. In the evening, he went out, and after stopping some time, returned with a young and pretty woman, who went upstairs with him, the concierge making no objection. In the night, the concierge, as already stated, was awakened by a strange noise on the staircase. He got up and found Poirier dragging down by the legs the body of a woman with her head cut off. The chemise of the victim was tied over the neck, probably to prevent the effusion of blood. The concierge, horrified, cried for his wife to come to him, and armed himself with an old sword which he possessed as a retired soldier. He then said to Poirier, Wretch, what have you done? You shall not pass. What matters, said Poirier, whether I pass or not? I am avenged on a woman who has made me suffer a good deal, and I, I have no wish to escape. Arrest me, if you like. He, however, returned upstairs, and the concierge and his wife hastened to summon the police. The police at once proceeded to the man's bedroom on the sixth story, but did not find him or any trace of the crime. They accordingly descended to the offices, the door of which was open, and found that the murder had been committed in a kitchen attached to them, which is fitted up as a bedroom. The first object that attracted their attention was an iron balance forming part of a letter-copying press, and as it was covered with blood and had hair adhering to it, it was evident that the victim had been beaten about the head with it. On a table was a knife stained with blood. Near the bed, which was also stained with blood, a fact which shows that the young woman must have been struck on the head whilst lying in it, was a large tin pail, nearly filled with blood, and in this pail was the head of the victim. The head, according to all appearance, had been cut off with the knife, but as the knife was old and much injured by use, the operation must have been a long and difficult one. The fleshy parts of the neck, for example, were not cut through, but hacked. A carpet by the side of the bed was saturated with blood. On the table were some empty bottles of wine, some biscuits, and other remains of a supper. The manner in which the murderer effected his escape has already been described. The name of the murdered female has not yet been ascertained but from her dress and appearance she is supposed to have been a femme de chambre, a maid. The crime captivated the Parisians. Focusing on the supposed love angle of the murder, there was sympathy for the murderer and his alleged broken heart. Parisians were also captivated by the ghoulish prospect of seeing the battered and beheaded young woman at the morgue. Parisians in their thousands rushed to the morgue to get a good look at the unidentified woman who had been so brutally beheaded. From the Morning Post, the 11th of August, 1856, The Frightful Murder in Paris The extraordinary murder in the Rue de la Philadelphe continues to excite profound sensation in Paris. Yesterday, 
the body was still exposed at the morgue and the head was fitted to the neck, the hair being so arranged to prevent the place where the head was severed being seen. The deceased appears to have been about 25 years of age and was rather vigorously constituted and of average height, but she was not so pretty as first stated. So vast a crowd assembled to view the body that it was expedient to form the persons composing into a line to be admitted two by two, but none of them recognised the woman. The police are making the most active searches after the murderer Poirier, but as yet without any success. It is considered probable that he has committed suicide, and it is supposed that in jumping from the window just before the police went to arrest him, his object was not to escape, but to kill himself. The Canal Saint-Martin was searched yesterday, but no dead body was found there. It appears from an examination of the body that the murderer must have stunned her by blows on the head with the iron bar of the copying press already alluded to, that then he stabbed her with a knife and received the blood which flowed from the wound into the pail, and that then, when she was quite dead, he proceeded to cut off her head. It is supposed that his intention was to dismember the body, but that after cutting off the head, he found that the operation would take too much time, and he accordingly determined to bury her in the cellar. Having completely stripped the woman and enveloped the neck in her chemise, as as first mentioned, to prevent the blood from falling about, he put the body on his shoulders with the legs in the air. He descended the staircase, and the arms fell and struck against the step, and it was the noise so occasioned which awoke the concierge. Had it not been for this noise, the man would have no doubt succeeded in burying the body, and he would have had then been easily been able to remove the head, the blood, and the other traces of his atrocious crime. The murderer, who it is stated belongs to a respectable family, is of short stature, slightly made, and of a harsh cast of countenance. He was attentive to his duties and gave satisfaction to his employers. Poirier is finally discovered hanging in the woods from a tree in an apparent suicide, as had been predicted by the police. His body is badly decomposed. He is identified primarily from the clothes and the keys to his room at the lodging house. Empty brandy bottles are nearby. From the Morning Post, the 14th of August, 1856, the late murder in the Rue de la Fidelte. Suicide of the murderer. It has at last been ascertained what has become of Poirier, the murderer of the woman Hadro, in the Rue de la Philadelphe. The dead body of a man was on Monday found hanging by the neck to a tree in an unfrequented part of the Bois de Vicennes, and two empty bottles which had contained brandy, were lying close by. The body was immediately taken to the morgue, and as there were no papers on it to show who the deceased was, the chief of the detective police, who was entrusted with the search after the murderer, was summoned. He found that the corpse was in such an advanced state of decomposition that it was impossible to make a description of it, but the height and the structure of the frame were the same as those of Poirier. The dress, too, consisting of a black frock coat, a dark pair of trousers, and a peculiar hat, the brim been lined with cloth, and a pair of slippers 
was precisely that which he had described to have worn on the night of the crime. Lastly, two keys were found on the deceased, and one of them turned out to be that of his room in the Rue de la Fidelte, the other that of the outer door of the office of the same address at which he was employed as a porter. The concierge of the house recognised the two keys. There is no doubt, therefore, that the body found is that of the murderer, and it is supposed that he committed suicide on Sunday the 3rd, the day following that on which the crime was perpetrated. A murderer who escaped the criminal justice system. Sadly, little else was known of this case in England. Morgue viewing. However, within the press, the case brought up the French predilection for going to the morgue to look at dead bodies as a form of entertainment. This fascination with the dead was prevalent in the Victorian era, but the French had transformed this activity into a form of entertainment. The Paris morgue became famous and a must-see when visiting. The Paris morgue was known to receive vast numbers of visitors regularly. Depending on the crime of the day, vast crowds could arrive, requiring the police to step in for crowd control. An average Parisian would scan the papers in the morning, noting any particularly gruesome deaths, and arrive at the morgue later to see the corpse on display in the window for themselves. Although the opening of the morgue was to allow family and friends to identify a missing relative or friend, the majority of the visitors to the Paris morgue were tourists. The more gruesome or mysterious the death, as recounted in the papers, the larger the number of people. When the newspapers reported a decapitated or bloody person to be on display, tens of thousands of people were known to attend. From the Crimson, men are crowding and elbowing each other, old hags are pointing towards the glass and croaking to one another. Pretty women are gazing with white faces of pity, but with none the less thirsty greediness. Upon some fascinating spectacle, little children are being held aloft in strong arms, that they too may see the dreadful thing, and they do see, and they toss their tiny wavering arms aloft and crow gleefully. Another article in describing the rush to view a new body writes, The mob rushes through the doors with savage cries. Fallen hats are trumped on, parasols and umbrellas are broken, and yesterday women fell sick, having been half suffocated. Paris guidebooks offered opening times and advice on the best times to visit the morgue as a tourist. Market stalls and hawkers popped up around the streets of the morgue selling sweets and oranges for the family day out. The morgue became one of the top tourist attractions of the city. By the close of the 19th century, the morgue had garnered such widespread attention that nearly every guidebook on Paris made mention of it. The social commentator Hughes Leroux penned in 1888, there are few people having visited Paris who do not know the morgue. Exploiting the heightened interest, local vendors swiftly capitalised on the phenomena. The sidewalk outside the morgue frequently teemed with individuals, hawking oranges, cookies and coconut slices. While other morgues may have drawn tourists, none could match the allure of Paris. In 1864, to accommodate the tourists, a new purpose-built morgue was built and designed to attract the maximum number of visitors, ostensibly as a means to expedite the identification of corpses. 
Situated behind the Cathedral of Notre Dame, deep in the heart of the city, the new morgue not only commanded a prime location, but also remained open from dawn to dusk, seven days a week, far surpassing the accessibility of any other prominent morgue of its time. The morgue's interior boasted a rather welcoming design, with the exhibition room accommodating up to fifty visitors, rows of lifeless forms lay on stone slabs behind glass windows. Flanking these windows stood a pair of verdant curtains, reminiscent of those found in a retail establishment. A spectacle likened to a large department store window when the merchandise has been removed on a Saturday night as per commentators of the time. Attendants of the morgue would hang the garments of the deceased on pegs adjacent to their bodies. Initially, in the earlier years of the morgue, cold water would drip onto their bodies from a tap in the ceiling to impede decomposition. By 1882, this method was replaced by an extensive refrigeration system. The morgue's well-attended exhibitions drew frequent comparisons to theatrical performances. Renowned French novelist Émile Zola described it as an affordable show for all. On rare occasions, when no bodies were on display, disgruntled crowds voiced their discontent, complaining that death allowed itself an intermission that day without thinking of their good pleasure. However, when observers labelled the morgue as a theatre, they referred not only to the sight of the lifeless figures, the visitors might also unexpectedly find themselves witnessing dramatic criminal investigations as well. Police frequently brought suspected murderers to the morgue, exposing them to their victims believing that the shock of seeing the consequences of their actions would elicit confessions. These confrontations became common, to the extent that in 1888 the Paris morgue installed electric lights, with the idea of increasing the effect produced upon murderers upon being confronted with their victims. Under the effect of the lights, the confrontations were expected to be much more effective. Remarkably, this strategy proved successful, with Paris police records documenting several instances of suspects who, after initially refusing to cooperate, confessed their crimes upon visiting the morgue. The morgue, as theatre, tourist attraction, and detection all in the centre of Paris, a French Victorian day out for the whole family. That concludes this episode of Murderous Mondays, Murder in Paris. We hope you enjoyed the show. If you did enjoy this show, we would be grateful if you could like or subscribe to our channel. We are passionate about historical crime and do our best to present interesting cases from long ago that go beyond the usual fare. For our listeners and subscribers, thank you. We so very much appreciate the many supporters and subscribers who have helped us to build this channel. The News of the Times team all appreciate each of you for your help. We upload four days a week. Saturdays are Serial Killer Saturdays, where we do an in-depth look at a serial killer from our extensive database. The time spans of these ranges from as early as the mid-16th century to the 21st century and encompasses men, women, children and couples who kill. Mondays are murderous, where we investigate in-depth a historical murder. Wednesdays are wicked where we pull together stories of a similar theme, such as stories of murders by starvation.
And Fridays are frightful, with stories that are grouped by geographic location, allowing us to share lesser-known grisly crime stories. From all of us at the News of the Times team, thank you again for watching or listening. This has been News of the Times, and I am Robin Coles.